see if I got it on this time. I, I was back there waiting and, and actually just know I was gauging and judging your response for summer Sundays and 21 days of prayer and fasting. Like, we were excited about the treats, and then I was waiting to see if we were going to be excited about the spiritual things that sometimes require a little bit more work than just grabbing something sweet and eating it. But we got some great things out there today. Make sure you do grab those. Uh, but I want to talk to you for a few moments about 21 days of prayer and fasting because it's important. Um, a, a lot of times people will ask, like, what's been the difference in the life of our church? And I normally can um, peel it back to two separate things. One is the launch of small groups for our church because with was always God's plan. And what we've seen is, like, how we connect here and here matters and like how as these connections grow we're challenged to continue to grow these connections and so small groups has been one the second thing that we've done is had a heart for prayer and as we've done 21 days of prayer before and and we've had our prayer services on saturdays and our call to prayer every day now at noon like I've seen God do incredible things, so I want to encourage you, and I also want to challenge you to participate in 21 days of prayer and fasting. We set aside this time, these three weeks, two different times in the year. We start the beginning of the year off, and then we start as summer begins to wind down, and we begin to look towards the fall. Most of us are gearing up for that change of school anyways. I know Mel talked about that a little bit. Um, and so we want to take those strategic and intentional times and focus our heart and our mind and our spirit once again on God. Not that we're not connected to him already, not that we're not doing things to grow our relationship, but there's something about setting intentional, si intentional time aside that God does incredible things with. And so I want to challenge you every day, starting today, set aside some time to pray. And here's, here's the easy parts of it. No one's going to tell you you're more spiritual or less spiritual based on the time that you set aside to pray. If you've been following Jesus and prayer is easy for you and you can sit there and pray for a half an hour, man, high five. That's great. Do you do what God is asking you to do. But if, if you're struggling to pray and you can pray for like three minutes and then you're like, man, I've prayed for every person I've ever known and every meal I've ever eaten and I have no idea what else to pray for. That's okay. Start somewhere. Start with three minutes. Start with five minutes. Just dedicate some time for God each day. Now, to help you, I don't want to just give you things to do and be like, well, I'm not sure if I can do this. So we want to help you to be able to accomplish this. So there's a few ways that you can do this. One is follow us on social media. Every single day we will have a prayer prompt that will give you an opportunity to focus your heart on something um, to lead you towards prayer. Every day. So social media, Facebook, Instagram, and then there's also a booklet. Some of you are like digital stuff. I have no idea how to work my phone. I barely can make calls on it. That's fine. Grab the Pray First booklet as you walk outside the doors. If you go out the center doors, it's right on the right-hand side. Grab those. Now, parents, if you want something to go through with your kids, if you have elementary age kids, we have a Pray First booklet for them. They are in the kids' area. You can grab those as you pick up your kids today. Um, but we wanted to give you something that you can walk through um, with your family for yourself and your family together and then there's also an app that you can get you see it here it's the pray first app um, this is what i use and it has everything that the pray first book has it just has it in digital form it also has worship music built in there um, there's some guided prayers like if you're like man i'm not sure what to do but i want to try to pray for like 10 minutes they have some guided prayers that will help you and prompt you at certain times to begin to change what you're praying for i found it incredibly helpful as i wanted to grow my time of prayer it helps a ton so guided prayers are in there there's also a list that you can put you can you can have a family uh prayer list and then you can write your different family members what's going on however it is that you want to break down your prayer list but there are things in there that will help you ultimately we want prayer to be your first response and, and I'll say this, we want prayer to be our first response, not our last resort. Like prayer is what connects us to God. Like that's why we emphasize the 21 days of prayer. And then on the other side of that, the fasting piece disconnects us from the world. So prayer connects us to God. Fasting helps disconnect us 
from the world. Because when we fast, we begin to ask God for more, more direction, more wisdom, a deeper relationship with him. Maybe you've been struggling with an addiction. You want to pray for that to be broken. Whatever it is, um, unsaved loved ones, you can commit the next three weeks and fast and disconnect from the world around you and ask that God would do something incredible. So we strengthen on one side. We, we um, weaken our connection to the world on the other side because what happens is we begin to look to things around us for things that God has promised to give us, right? Oh, I just need to unwind. Well, how do you unwind? How do you find peace? How do you just kind of let go? Like, what do you turn to? What do you look at? Where do you give your energy, your time, and your attention to? Is it God who promises to be our peace? Is it God who, who promises to give you not just happiness but joy? Is it God? Are you looking to him to give you the comfort and confidence that you need to rest? Or are you trying to manufacture that on your own? So how do you do it? How do you fast? Will you decide what it is you're going to fast? Am I going to fast food? Now, some of us, we could probably do this. For some of us in the room, you might be thinking, man, three weeks is a really long time. I'm not sure if I can do that. I would encourage you, if you're worried about, like, your health or anything over the next few weeks, man, check with your doctor. Like, find out if you can actually fast for three weeks because we don't want you to try and do something that actually ends up hurting you. Um, Also, you can fast. Maybe you can't do all day for 21 days then maybe you can do one meal, like figure out a meal that you can do every day or or one meal a week or one day a week. Like ask God, what is God laying on your heart? And then take some steps of faith. Now, one thing I will tell you, if you don't, I think I said this last week, if you don't eat breakfast, don't tell God you are fasting breakfast for him for the next three weeks. David said, I won't offer God things that didn't cost me anything. So let's not talk about sacrificing things to God if it ain't a sacrifice. If you wake up every day at noon, you miss breakfast anyways. So don't tell God you're fasting breakfast when you just don't eat it, right? We want to offer God something that we're actually sacrificing. But it doesn't actually just be, or it doesn't actually just mean food. You can fast social media, secular music, movies, games, entertainment, news, whatever your go-to might be to take your mind off of things, to give you relief, comfort, to just unwind, you need to make sure that we are now looking to God for those things. And as you let go of one thing, we want to replace it with something godly. We don't just want to not eat. You want to now spend your time with God. So do things that connect you to God. The time that you would spend scrolling on Facebook, if that's maybe something that you would want to give up, social media, how much time do you spend a day or every time you go to do this? And some of you guys be scrolling so fast. It makes me dizzy watching the zoom, zoom, zoom. Like, I don't, I don't get how quickly you can do that. But what if every 10 minutes that you want to grab your phone, instead of doing that, then you would open the Bible app, you would read the verse of the day. You would just begin to meditate on that and think about what it means. You would begin to pray. There's a prayer attached to that. If you click the, um, the daily reminder each day, it walks you through even a prayer that you can pray over there. And so whatever it is, the time that you would spend doing those things, you now spend time with God. You spend time praying, reading his word, listening to worship music, whatever it may be. And if you mess up, hear me in this. If you mess up, start again. The enemy would love nothing more than to tell you you are not good at this at all. That God is so upset and disappointed with you, he will try to heap condemnation on you. That's because he doesn't want what's on the other side of your sacrifice. He doesn't want what's on the other side of the time you spend with God during these 21 days of prayer and fasting. So can I tell you? Don't let him win. Don't let him win. Some of us, our stories, we, we, we battle after battle after battle. Let's take the battle to the enemy this next 21 days. Let's spend some time fighting with our prayer. Let's spend some time um, a, a, away from things that are distracting us, that are pulling on our time, that are moving us further from God, or maybe just not helping us get close to him. Let's spend some time. Let's go on the offensive Let's take it to the enemy. I believe that as we do these things, as we spend the next three weeks in prayer and fasting, I believe that God will do some incredible things. And so here's my challenge. As you begin to pray and ask God to do things, and he begins to do it, write it down, take a picture, make a video. 
Because as we do this over and over again, I want to be able to encourage us all to say, hey, man, Sheila talked about what she prayed about, and God did even more than she was asking. Let's celebrate that with her so that all of our faith can get risen by God responding to the individual needs and prayers that we're praying. Does that make sense? All right, let's jump in to today. Last week, we started talking about prayer, and some of you have already griped at me about last week. I am sorry, not sorry. Um, I had one lady come up to me, and she was like, you are in so much trouble. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you said that we could pray powerful prayers. And I prayed powerful prayers, and guess what? And then she began to tell me all of the things that started happening as she was praying these powerful prayers. And I'm like, okay, isn't that the point? Like, we want God to do some incredible things. Like, let's pray and believe that he can do just that. And the whole point of last week wasn't so that we could pray these these monster-sized prayers is that we could remember that how we pray reflects what we think about God. That as we pray, do we believe that God can do the impossible? Do we believe that he can heal? Do we believe that he can do anything? Do our prayers reflect that? And so that was the challenge of last week to begin to think like, hey, let's pray right. Let's learn how to pray powerful prayers. And so I want us all to become more comfortable with praying Like you might have one time where you got this big need and it's like, yeah, I can pray for that one big thing. But what about every day as we walk into 21 days of prayer and and maybe it just becomes a habit and a a part of who you are. Like, how can you be more comfortable in what you say and how you do this? And so let's look at what Jesus says when it comes to prayer. Today's message, my title comes right from his words to us from Mark or from Matthew's gospel. It's simple today. It's just when you pray and let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence and to look in your word. And so we ask that as we do it, you would speak to us. God, you know where we are. You know what we're facing. You know maybe even the struggles that we have when it comes to to communicating with you. Lord, I pray that you would break down barriers. You would help us to hear your voice today. And God, I pray that as I communicate your word to your people, you would anoint me to do it clearly and confidently and in a way where they hear you more than they hear me. God, bless this time that we spend together in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. This is where we're going to be as we're talking about prayer, and we're going to go right into it. Verse 5 says this. This is Jesus talking. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. Now, before we get into this, my first point today, when it comes to when we pray, is very simple. It's this. Start. Did you notice how Jesus began this conversation on prayer? He didn't say, if you pray, or if you think about praying, he said, when you pray. For Jesus, this isn't something that's negotiable. He expects us as followers to pray. If we are supposed to be Christ-like and like him, and he was a man of prayer, then that means we are supposed to be a people of prayer. So when we read this, like sometimes we get past even these first few verses because following this is the Lord's Prayer. And we're like, yeah, let's learn the Lord's Prayer. But we miss that Jesus is like, hey, when you pray. Don't overlook this. Don't think that that prayer is just for the spiritually strong, the mature. No, no, no. He expects all of us to pray. So start. Start praying. We need to decide now to pray first, that that needs to become a part of who we are. Before we make decisions, we're praying. When we're frustrated, we pray. When we're angry, we pray. When we're hurt, we pray. Before you send that email, or you tell them what someone should have told them when they were a teenager, or whatever it might be before you respond, we pray. We want to commit to being people that pray first. Not after all the things we tried didn't work, and we made stuff worse, and now we're like, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me? Like, no, he's trying to teach you the same thing, but it was way back in the beginning. Let's begin to pray first, as a first resort, not as a last resort. So we got to start. Don't wait for the perfect time for your schedules to line right up. Let's eliminate excuses, our fears, anything that would keep us from doing this. We have to start because we will never be a people of prayer if we don't actually start praying. So let's start. The second thing, and I contemplated changing this 
point, but I like it. So the second point is this, stay out of the streets. If this was, now some of y'all just got convicted for where you was at last night. That ain't even what we talking about. <coughs> if this was a rap song, we would have spelled this different and we would have just said stay out the streets. I, I'm always, when I wrote this and, and Britt and I, like I sent her my notes and she makes the slides each week and she's like, I just started laughing. I said, Britt, actually I heard you when I was making this. Because there would be times where we'd be like, where's Gams at, Britain? She's like, she's out running the streets. And so we just hear things like that. So I heard this as we were writing this down. Um, so this is funny, but I hope that you remember because Jesus was making a very clear point right out of the gate. He doesn't want us to mess up when it comes to prayer. So he tells us flat out, man, don't be fake when it comes to praying. He says, don't be like the hypocrite. Now, for us, we would think of a hypocrite as someone who says one thing and does another. We probably know hypocrites, and we've probably seen them in the mirrors looking back at us at different stages in our lives. That's not the kind of hypocrite that Jesus was talking about. In Jesus' day, a hypocrite was actually an actor. Someone who is paid to put on a show, to pretend, to not really be connected to what they're doing, but just make a good show of it. What's he say about them? He says, man, they love to pray. Don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray. Notice he didn't say they love prayer. They love connecting to God. They love all that prayer does for them. No, no, no. It says they love prayer because everybody can see them. He says they stand on the street corners and pray. They don't love prayer. They love how spiritual they look when other people notice that they're praying. They love how other people will consider them spiritual as they are connecting to God. See, Jesus wants us to have an actual connection with him, not just the appearance of one. He doesn't want us to go through the motions. Now, he's not forbidding public prayer. He's not saying if you're out in public and someone asks you to pray for them, he's not saying, hey, don't, don't do that. He's just saying don't make a spectacle. You don't have to draw all the attention on you. That's not why someone may have asked you for prayer. They're looking for his power, not you on a podium. Now, why would Jesus say don't pray on the street corners? Why would we be talking about stay out the streets? That is not one of the things that would actually happen in Jesus' day. Like it wasn't a practice to go and pray on street corners. But here's what Jesus was noticing. There is a call to prayer in the afternoon. And every now and then what would happen is the religious priests, all of the guys who wear the cool robes, and you know they got a cool relationship with Jesus. As they're making their way to the temple, sometimes their pace would get slower as people were around on the busy streets and as they're making their way to the synagogue. And, oh, you know, it's time to pray. I didn't make it into the synagogue, so I guess I'll just have to pray here. Oh, God. Lord, you know that I love you more than everyone else around. Like, then they begin to pray like that, right? They begin to draw a crowd and pray in front of everyone so their spirituality was on display. He's saying, man, don't, don't be like them. So if your alarm goes off at noon today and you're in Jack Stack eating a meal, your table doesn't have to stand up and shout your prayer out. You can just pray at your table because this part of prayer isn't about us making a spectacle. It, it, Jesus is actually wanting us to make sure that we're checking our heart and our motives for prayer. If it was just about the words that you say or, or how many or how loud or how well you could do it, he would be applauding the hypocrites for doing such a good job. But that's not what he's doing. He's saying you better check your heart and don't do it for everybody else is praise. Are you actually praying to capture God's heart or are you praying to capture man's attention? Because if people's admiration and attention is your motive, then it will also be the only answer to the prayer you get. And that's what Jesus said. He said they've gotten their reward. So watch how you pray in public. Stay out of the streets. Verse 6, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. 
then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Now, Jesus begins to make this transition, praying publicly without connecting privately, seems to make it all about us. I want people to look at me, to look how good I sound, and, but he wants things to come from a sincere heart. And when it doesn't, it becomes nothing more than a show. So we have to be careful. As Jesus is painting these two contrasting pieces of prayer, we find that private dedication outweighs public declaration. So what do we do here? We've talked about starting. We're going to stay out of the streets. You will never forget that point, at least for the next day. Next week you might forget it, but today you'll remember it. Now we need to shut the door. See, Jesus begins to talk to them about shutting a door behind them. Go into the storeroom. Go into your closet are the things and the words that he uses. Now, when he does this, everybody immediately knows what he's talking about. It's not the, the war room that, that's in the movie that challenges us to have a place where we pray. Jesus was actually telling them, hey, there's a room in your house that doesn't have any windows. Actually, this is probably the only room in your house that you can go into and close the door and lock it. Go inside there and pray. And when you do that, your heavenly father who sees what's going on will reward you. Do you see what Jesus is doing? Do you see the contrast from the first scripture that we read into this one? Do you see what he's asking us to do? He's wanting us to get away from the distractions from the noise to shut it all out so that we can focus on him see if prayer is the anchor of our relationship with jesus then shutting the door is a way of us to say that this is a priority for us we begin to set a time and a place to meet with him we stop making excuses for why this can't be a daily part of who we are. I, I know that, that we're busy, and I, I get that, like we, but we need to at some point begin to stop making excuses and make this a priority because all of us know how to do this. When things become a priority, we begin to rearrange our schedule to accommodate the priority that's going on in our world. And I know that we're busy. We, we wear busy like a badge of honor. And I would respond that we are too busy not to pray. So if you're jumping into your day with all the busyness and chaos that may be headed your way, why would you not want to start your day in prayer and take that with you into your busy schedule? I'm not saying that we're not busy because we are. But I would ask you for a couple of things. If you are so busy, let me check your streaming history. Let me see what you're watching and how much you're watching. Let me see your text and Facebook log, or Facebook, your, your FaceTime log. Some of you are like, man, I don't got time, but you FaceTime people four or five hours out there. You're supposed to be working, and you are FaceTiming people. Hey, hey, don't say anything right now. I got you on mute. Yeah. Let me, let me look at that. And then the last thing would be just let me look at your calendar. Let me see what's actually taking up. I bet we could find some time. Because when it becomes a priority, we make it a point to find time. Jesus asks us to shut the door so that we can remove the things that are pulling on us. For most of us, it looks like a phone. For a lot of us, there comes distractions because we get notifications and text messages and phone calls and this alert and that alert. Maybe in order to spend some time to shut the door, we need to turn our phones to do not disturb. Or we need to put it, we need to turn them off because some of us are afraid that when we put it on do not disturb, we'll miss something. And so we're, okay, well, just one second. Even though it's on do not disturb, we are still checking things. Maybe we need to just change the atmosphere. We need to put on worship music. Maybe in your place, that's what you do. Maybe your favorite candle would kind of set the mood for you and set the room. Maybe you do need your Bible, you need a journal, something like that. What I would encourage you to do is just shut the door. Find a spot where it's just you and Jesus, where you set aside some time for just the two of you. And hold tightly like this, which is actually not very tightly, to that place. Because we all know that seasons in our lives change. Your work schedule can change. Your kids' schedules can change. Like what matters changes. And so I would tell you that your place is your place, even if that place changes. 
you can still shut the door no matter if it's not an actual door that you're shutting to a room. If you need to change your time and your place, do that. If it needs to become your car because now instead of working from home, you have to commute to and from work and you have 35 minutes in your car, leverage that. Spend time with Jesus. What if it is in your office, on your porch, in your bathroom? Because some of us with kids, bathrooms, a locked door is the only place we will get privacy from our kids. And sometimes when they're little, we're afraid to lock the door because, like, what if they need us? They need to get, and, man, they come barging right in. What are you doing? Just leave me alone. I'm trying to pray. Oh, okay. So lock the door. Find some space. What if it's on the treadmill? You get up and you work out anyways, but what if every time you jump on the treadmill, you play something, you listen to something, you begin to pray while you're running on the treadmill? Maybe you go for a walk each day, whatever it is. I want to encourage you to do your best to give God your best, and then also give him your first. Throughout scripture, we see God does something different with first. Do you know that in our culture, the reason why we have church on Sunday is because Sunday is the first day of the week? And the thought is that if we give God time in our week at the beginning of the week, we invite him in to bless the rest of the week. Did you know that's the same concept with tithe? We give God the first 10%, and we honor him with first, and we ask him to bless the rest of it. The same thing with our time and our day. What if we begin to give God our first? Now, you may not be able to give him 10% of your day or anything like that, but what if you just give him the first few moments of your day? Even if you are best, if you need to set aside time in the afternoon to get to God, because that's your best shot at having time alone and spending time with him, that's great. But give him the first of your day whenever that begins. If that's while you're brushing your teeth, you're doing something cool, you're listening to worship music, you're praying a prayer, give him your first and give him your very best to spend time with him. And don't, again, don't hold tightly to the space and, and the place portion. Because shutting the door, what you'll learn is it's not just about the place, but it's actually finding that God is your special place. David writes over and over in the Psalms about how God is his hiding place, the secret place. Over and over again, we learn that we spend time with God, that we can come to him. We seek him and we find him. Just one of the places, just one. I only searched this one time. The first one that pops up is something that we can experience. What David says in Psalm 32, 7, for you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. See, when you set your heart on God, when you set aside time and, and a place to spend with him, then ultimately you will discover that the reward is him, not the things that he's doing for you. It's him. You discover that God is good. You discover that he is your protection, that he will give you victory, that God wants to use you, that he loves you unconditionally, that he gives you strength when you're weak, that you can lean on him for everything. Not just in the big moments, the, the places where you need and miracles and you're so desperate. Not just in those moments, but every day he's my source. I go to him because he has exactly what I need every day. Our time with him grows our relationship with him and it keeps us living in connection with him. Here's the last couple of verses. Jesus says, when you pray, notice that phrase again. Like, it's been in almost all of these verses. We're only reading five, six, seven, eight. We're only reading four verses. And Jesus is repeating this over and over. When you pray, don't babble. On and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. So we're going to start praying. We're going to stay out of the street. We're going to shut the door. The last thing, when you pray, say it with your chest. This. <laughs> Some of you are clapping. You're like, I don't understand. Let me help you. 
this is, th- these verses are, are some of the, the reasons why I'm just like, man, Jesus is savage every now and then. Because he don't stop. He keeps coming for people's necks. Like he already said, don't pray out loud just to draw attention. And now he is saying that offering a lot of words isn't the same as offering your heart. He wants us to say it with our chest, not loud and in front of everyone. He just wants our heart. He wants our words to be sincere. What's really funny is the more you look at this verse, the word that Jesus uses when he says babble sounds like the word or sounds like babbling, like a babbling brook. And it means just that. So when he's like, hey, don't babble, there would have been this echoing of him saying babbling. And it would have been a lot like blah, 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 blah. You ever met anyone like that? Like they just start talking so much that you're like, I don't even know what you're saying anymore. I'm just going to keep nodding because I, I can't even get a word in right now. Jesus is saying, look, don't just babble on and on thinking. Now, not just the amount of words, but why are we babbling? Why are we using a lot of words? Jesus is like, look, look don't make it seem like that makes you more spiritual. Or if you use a lot of words, that God's going to hear you because you used a lot of words. He keeps going. He's like, don't do this. Don't just use words. Don't just repeat them like some kind of mantra. Now, he's not forbidding repeating prayers. He's not saying, hey, if you pray for it once, don't pray for it again. Other places in scripture, he reminds us to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Don't just do it once. Keep doing it. Jesus actually tells a story. And before he tells the story, it says Jesus tells a story so that we would pray and not give up. If you look at Jesus's prayer life, he prayed all night. He spent time praying. He also prayed the same prayer three different times in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's not just talking about repetitious prayer. He's telling us, don't let prayer become a repetitious religious mantra. Why would he say that, though? Well, because the Romans and the Greeks believed that you had to get the attention of your God. Because they had short attention spans or, or maybe they just weren't paying attention to the people that, that they were their subjects. You weren't important enough. So in order to get their attention, you had to say a lot of things and repeat it a lot in hopes of getting their attention. And then once you got their attention, you had to keep babbling and saying the same things over and over because you might just lose their attention. And if you're like, whatever, that doesn't make sense. Go read 1 Kings 18. There's a battle on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And for hours, you will see this. The prophets of Baal chant and pray, oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us for hours. And nothing happens. Jesus is telling us, men, our hearts matter more than the number of words. Say it with your chest. Be sincere. Pray what you mean. Mean what you pray. Man, if you're asking for something, you don't have to justify your ask. You don't have to read off your resume to God before you ask. You know, Lord, I've been coming to this church for the last four years. I sit in the third row right on the end every single Sunday. If someone's in my space, Lord, I pray that they move so I could be in my special spot. Because, you know, that's just for me. And, you know, during worship, Lord, I don't raise one hand. I raise two hands. And I don't hold them down at my side. I raise them high so everyone can see them. And, Lord, did you know that I taught Sunday school for 17 years? And did you know that I tied faith? Like, we don't have to repeat all of this stuff and read off this list that makes us qualified to give him our prayer. We can do just what Mary and Martha did. When they were in desperate need for their brother, they just said, Lord, the one you love is sick. That was it. They knew that that was enough for Jesus. So whatever it is that you need, don't think that you have to quote things and and get things done a certain way for God to pay attention to you. Just bring him what's going on. If you're struggling, if you're trying to process through something, some of you are, you need to talk out what you're, what you're going through so that you can process it. You need to out loud process. You can do that with God. It's okay. He's not going to be like, man, why? Their prayer is all over the place. Somebody call me when they get one thing. Like, no, he's, he's not going to do that. He's going to listen to what's going on because he already knows. If you're angry, if you're hurting, if you're upset, if you're confused, 
all of those things are okay to bring to God in prayer. He's not afraid of the emotions that he created and gave you. Well, I don't know, man, I get pretty, man, go read some Psalms. Like David lets us see that God can handle our emotions. So just pray it, bring it to him. He's not afraid. Whatever is going on, let what you're praying about dictate how you pray and even maybe sometimes how long you pray. If there's just something going on, you're like, man, God, I need to bring this to you right now. Man, just bring it. If there are other things that are weighing on you, it's okay to just open your heart and share. That's what he wants you to do. And then Jesus does something that is unexpected. Because after he says all of these things that, that we should be saying it with our chest, he says this, look who's on the other side of the prayer. When he starts talking about God being on the other side of, of our prayers, he's not just saying that there's a creator of everything there. He's not talking about just there's this all-powerful, all-knowing God sitting on a throne that's far away in the distance. He doesn't even call him the father of all mankind. But he says, your heavenly father, your father, knows what you need even before you ask. Jesus could have used any way he wanted to describe who was on the other side of the prayer. He made it a point to let you know this morning that your father is on the other side of that prayer. It's personal to him. So be sincere. Invite your father into the situation he already knows you're in. And can I remind you of this? Kids don't need speeches. To get to their dad they just need to whisper what's going on he knows the need already he's attentive to our voice and and as we invite him in ephesians 3 reminds us that god does even more than we can ask or think I mean, when i come home from work this doesn't happen every day but some days when i come through the door i hear something along the lines of is that my dad? Dad, are you home? And then one or both of my kids will make their way towards where I'm at. And for the next few, or 20 minutes, we'll talk about what's in their day. Sometimes it's a lot. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes I have to tell them to slow down and take a breath because I don't think they're breathing. They're saying so many things all at once, all at the same time. But here's the truth. I love it. I love when I can ask my kids, how was your day? What's going on? What'd you do? Whatever it is, and they begin to open up and invite me into what's going on. I love it when they include me. And not just in the great things that are fun and exciting and it keeps me from not being bored, but when they share all of what's going on. Their frustrations, their bad days, their hearts are hurting, they're confused. Whatever it is, I love when they invite me in. Today, I want to remind you that your father is looking forward to hearing from you. He's looking forward, forward to hearing from you, his daughter, and from you, his son, and from you, his son from you, his daughter. He's anxiously awaiting to hear his kid's voice because he loves us. He loves you so much. Do, do you understand that the relationship with you, with us, was so important that he sent Jesus? Because with was always his plan. God created us to be with him. But then sin showed up and it separated us from God. And, and no matter how much good we could do, it didn't replace, it didn't cover up the sin that we had committed. So a price had to be paid and Jesus came and he paid that price. He paid the price so that we could be reconciled to God. So that the, the big gap between us and God, there could now be a bridge that Jesus would become so we could get back to our Heavenly Father. And Jesus made it easy. He said that everyone who believes in me can have life. And that life with Jesus starts now and it lasts forever. 
So maybe there are some of you here today that you need to invite him into your life. That communicating with God feels weird because you don't really have a relationship with him, but today that can change. Would you close your eyes for just a moment so that you can spend some time just reflecting on God's voice? Is he inviting you into a relationship today? If you say, Pastor Kevin, that's me. I need to to give my life to Jesus. I need a relationship with him. I, I need a new one, or I need to reconcile my relationship with him. If that's you this morning, I just want you to raise your hand and make eye contact with me. Say, today is the day I choose Jesus. Is there anyone in the room this morning? Yeah. Anybody else? Would you stand with me all around the room this morning as we get ready to move into our response time? And those of you who are ready to pray with people, if you could make your way down. Here's what I would like for you to respond to today. And it's not my voice, but it's God's voice. And so what has he been saying to you? For some of you, when I asked about a relationship with God, you began to feel uneasy on the inside. But you didn't raise your hand. You were a little afraid. You need to accept Jesus. The team's down here. They'll love to pray with you, walk you through a relationship that begins a relation, or walk you through a prayer that begins a relationship with Jesus. But maybe today that's not why you need to respond. Maybe today you just need to spend some time talking to your Heavenly Father. Whatever's been going on, there may be a couple of you in this room that, man, you just shut him out. And maybe it's not intentional. Maybe it's just like you've been trying to do this stuff all on your own. And you came in here tired and frustrated. Today I would invite you to spend a few minutes talking with your Heavenly Father. Invite him in. Maybe there's stuff that's going on. Maybe you need to come and and tell God that that you're going to make it a priority to spend time with him. You will shut the door. Maybe you just need to shut the door right in this room while all of us are here, while his presence is here, and spend some time with him. I'm going to ask the worship team to sing, and while they do, make your way to the front. Kneel at your seat, whatever it may be, but respond to what God is saying to you. If you need a relationship with him or you just need to spend some time with your Heavenly Father, respond while the worship team sings. Oh, my words are true. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing this song as I often do, but every song must fail, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. All that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, I've got one response, I've got just one move, with my arms stretched wide, I will worship you, so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I have Nothing else fit for a 
Come on, my soul. Hold on to get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those bones. Get up there and praise the Lord. And come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. praise you again and again cause all that I have is in hallelujah hallelujah I know it's not much I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Every battle you've won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. And I've tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. But you choose someone like me to carry your victory. And you are my champion. And giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Hey. 
lift my voice and shout every wall comes crashing down i have the authority jesus has given me when i open up my mouth miracles start breaking out i have the authority Jesus has given me, and when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down, I have the authority, oh, Jesus has given me, when I open Miracles start breaking out. I have the authority. Oh, Jesus has given me. You are my champion. And giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated. By the power of your name, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered all. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. And I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated. By the power of your name, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. With the one who has conquered it all. Lord, we thank you that you are our champion. Lord, we thank you for the word that you have spoken. Lord, and for how you have so obviously moved in this place here today. Lord, allow our hearts and our minds to be changed in a way that is life-changing. Lord, in a way that changes the trajectory of our lives right here today. Lord, we surrender, we submit our lives to you. Lord, let this not just be a moment that we have um, and that passes by tomorrow morning, but let this be a moment that marks us, Jesus. Let allow us to be marked by all that you are, by all that you have spoken, Lord, all that you have laid on in our hearts, all that you have convicted us of, Jesus. Let us be changed by all that you are, Jesus. And we love you. We thank you. We are excited because we can celebrate what you have done here in this place, Lord. We don't have to leave sad or, or, or be... Continue to choose you, relationship with you, to deepen our prayer lives with you, Lord. Walk with us, Jesus. Allow us to walk with you, hand in hand, Jesus, as you teach us how to pray, how to talk to you, how to go to you, and allow that to be our response. And we love you, we thank you, and in your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Guys, I want to thank you so much for being here this morning. I want to encourage you, service is officially dismissed. This is our last summer Sundays. We have party with the pastor starting in 10 minutes. So we will meet you in the chapel this week. Thank you, guys.